few moments, I'll be reading for our text from the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, Genesis chapter 13. But let me say a couple of things before I move into the lesson and read the text. First of all, I think uh, it would be appropriate for us to uh, appreciate uh, a number of you that are part of this congregation that were involved in uh, this, this weekend in this uh, famous mission of mercy. I, I don't know if you were reading the paper and you found over and over again uh, stories about that, and, and it was just uh, such an event in, in our community where a dentist and and others uh, worked on the dental care for people voluntarily doing that, uh, doing it free of charge. And I understand uh, around 900 people were helped over that Friday and Saturday period. Someone told me that 12 or 15 people of this congregation were involved. And, and of course, the leadership of that was in the hands of uh, Todd Bridges. Uh, and I know it's uh, a picture of his father involved in it, too. And, and we're just happy that our people are involved in things like that and, and uh, a part of the community uh, like that. I know the uh, young people were involved in preparing packets for people to take home. And, and of course, uh, our Bible study method in the, in the track was uh, put in the packet so that uh, people could take that home and hopefully study it. So that was a, a very, very uh, special time for this community. And again, our people involved in it made it very special too. May I reiterate what uh, Jean said a moment ago about the Affirming the Faith uh, seminar that'll be in Oklahoma City. A number of you have gone through the years and I wish I could identify you so that others could talk with you. Affirming the Faith is a, a, a workshop that basically is on Saturday. It's at the North MacArthur Church building. It's very easy to get to. You go up I-44, hit uh, I-40 uh, going uh, west, you go to MacArthur, you turn right, north MacArthur, and you just go up uh, that uh, street and you'll come to the church building on your right side. Uh, it's a wonderful workshop. Imagine fifth, around 1,500 of your brothers and sisters in Christ sitting down in an auditorium and singing as we've done this morning. Uh, great speakers are coming from all over the country to speak in those uh, worship sessions. Then they have uh, classes, and uh, seven different classes are offered during the, the class sessions through the day. So you have a multitude of choices. As uh, was said, I, I'm humbled to be one of the teachers. You really don't need to come and hear me because you probably heard all the things that I will be saying, uh, and, and there are so many other options. So uh, that is three weeks from yesterday. It's coming upon us three weeks from yesterday. And I would imagine if we have interest enough, we could probably take a van or bus or whatever uh, and uh, have uh, as many of our people going for this very, very enriching experience. And I hope you'll take advantage of it. Now for our text. From deep in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 13, I want to begin with verse 8 and read through verse, uh, verse 13. Genesis chapter 13, beginning with verse 8. And Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen, uh, my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you take to the right, uh, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. I want to look at this passage. Think about it with you. You'll notice the expression, he pitched his tent toward Sodom. That will be our focus this morning. Notice the context, Abram, and by the way, later on, he is renamed by God himself, Abraham. And so I'll, I'll probably call him both of those. 
Abram or Abraham has his son, uh, his nephew Lot with him, and they're journeying as nomads would and providing uh, grass for, and water for their, for their livestock, and they're journeying around through the promised land. And uh, it makes the point of the relationship of these two. Abram is very rich, we're told, in 13 verse 2 of the same chapter. Lot obviously is being blessed immensely by the relationship he has to his uncle. Abram is one of the great men of the Bible, one of the treasures of mankind. And it's great, obviously, for him to have, for Lot to have that tie with uh, Abram. Three times uh, it is mentioned that Abraham worshiped God. And uh, that's in the immediate context, really. Doesn't say much about Lot worshiping God, but it makes the point not only was Abraham wealthy in material things, but he was a man that knew God and called upon his name. We should obviously prize and search out such kind of ties in our lives to find those people that can bless us and the relationships we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 says, evil, uh, evil company corrupts good habits. Well, you can turn the, uh, that around and look at the other side of the coin. Obviously, good companions can enrich our lives and bless us in so many ways. There are many reasons why many, many, many of you are here every time the doors are open. And I would say for one very good reason, you want to be here because of the relationships that you have established that are important to you. You know that people truly care about you and, and, are, are, and, and want your life to be blessed. And those relationships are critical. Now, Lot had that. He had that relationship. And, of course, was blessed so much by it. But secondly, I want to look at what I've called the request. At 13.9 that I read a moment ago. Abram says, please separate from me. Abram did that, said that to Lot. For what reasons? Well, first of all, the land couldn't support them both together. All their livestock was so immense that they couldn't move together. There wasn't enough to, to uh, uh, supply what is needed for both flocks. It's sort of like what we have at the uh, National Wildlife Refuge, 59,000 acres just to the north of us. But of course you know that uh, they have a sale there every year. Longhorn sale comes in September. The uh, buffalo sale comes in October. Why? Because that 59,000 acres cannot support the animals. Uh, they, they get, they, there become too many of them, and they need to sell them off. They need to say at a certain level. Well, that's sort of what we have in this particular passage before us now. You have too many animals for the land available. Secondly, it says that there was strife among the uh, herdsmen, among their workers. Well, you don't want to fuss in a fight among your uh, helpers. And it makes the point that there were others in the land sort of squeezing at them. So again, it was time for them to separate as far as Abram was concerned. And uh, Abram makes the point, I don't want any strife. Well, of course, nobody does. You don't want strife. And then he uses this expression that uh, in the King James is translated, we be brethren. After all, we stand together as brethren, as, as family. So let's not have difficulties with this. By the way, there's a title of a book uh, that uh, we have in our library and have been, been used many, many times by that very uh, designation, We Be Brethren. And it's about how to look at the uh, relationship of, of the church treasury to what we do and, and cannot do as far as the church is concerned. It's a wonderful book, and I remember a, a lovely family here that... Uh, uh, was uh, influenced greatly by that book, and, and I think they would say bless their lives immensely. But again, they're brethren, uh, and uh, we are in that uh, p position. And uh, he wanted to separate amicably with goodwill, and the offer was you choose one way, I will go the other. You can, you can go to the left, you can go to the right. doesn't make any difference with me, or at least what he's, and, and that's what he said. So uh, Lot had the first choice. And that's interesting, isn't it? We often have 
to separate. Think of families. Think of the jobs that many times separate us. Think of the armed services, and certainly we know that in, uh, in this community. And now we're separated for months and months and months from those that we love dearly uh, by uh, service in the uh, army and other, other branches. Family ties often are separated. Mom and dad may live halfway across the country. That's a part of the reality of life. And then, of course, uh, you have uh, uh, illnesses and, and things like that. And you, you could go on and on with that. But the point is, we're cut loose. We're separated from one another. Genesis chapter 31, verse 49, same book, but later on. Laban, the father-in-law of Jacob, says this to him. May the Lord watch between you and me when we are separate one from another. What a beautiful passage. And again, the separation. And may God bless us as we are divided and we are set apart from one another for whatever reason it may be. My third point has to do with the reasoning of Lot. What is he thinking as his magnanimous uncle says, you have your choice to the right or to the left, and I'll go the other direction. Well, it was indeed an unselfish, generous offer to the nephew, and uh, obviously Lot did not take into account a number of things, a respect for his uncle and what he had done for him, the appreciation of what had happened in his life be, because of Abram, the right of Abraham actually to choose first. He's older. He's the head of the clan. The Lord, after all, had promised the land of Canaan to Abram, not to Lot. And uh, he, of course, was the great benefactor of Lot. But in verse 11, it says, worlds. Lot chose for himself. I'm thinking of me. And that's the important element. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 reminds us, in honor giving preference to one another. Well, that's not what Lot did. He chose for himself what would happen in this situation. And there were lots going for him. Lots going for Lot, you might say. Uh, he looked, he lifted up his eyes and he saw. He saw, of course, the, the plain, the Jordan Valley, one of the most beautiful and productive areas literally in the world today even. He saw that. He saw that it was well watered. And, of course, water was absolutely critical in that part of the world. He could compare it to the Garden of Eden, to paradise, and even to Egypt. They had been down into Egypt recently, and there were some wonderful things about Egypt, especially along the Nile River and the Nile Delta. And so all of that would say, choose this area. So he did. But it was a matter of choosing by appearance and by self-interest. With that in mind, let me go to my fourth step that I've called the road to ruin. He made his decision. It seems to me as you look at it, there are four different steps. And watch these as we go through the text. Number one, he lifted up his eyes and saw. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, he's just viewing. He's just looking at the scene. He's evaluating. I'm sure he would look to the left and to the right. He wanted to analyze it, and so he looked. And there's nothing, again, as I say, wrong, sinful about that. He was just looking at it. And that's all right. But then he makes a decision. He makes a choice. And it says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now, Sodom is in the picture, but it's not directly in the picture. Not in that beautiful Jordan Valley. But the third step is, I mean, we move from a tent, a temporary dwelling, to a house now. In fact, we're told in chapter 19, verse 2, as you keep reading through Genesis. In 19, 2, he's living in a house. We've given up that temporary dwelling thing. And now we're in a permanent house. And we're not only in a permanent house, we're within the city of Sodom. And so we are uh, very much settled in to that place. And then finally, it says in chapter 19, verse 1, he's sitting at the gate of the city. Now you think, okay, what does that mean? It means more than simply locating at the open gate. That was the traditional place that was the center 
of community life. It was the place where so much important business was transacted. It was the place, and this may even be true of Lot, where the officials of a community would, uh, would be in the coming and going of people into the community and out of the community. So with all of that, step one through step four, I want to use a rather big word, extrapolation. And let me just explain what it is. Extrapolation refers to what we normally call the snowball effect. You start with a tiny little ball of snow and you start rolling it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it rolls down the hill to the point that it may be a monster ball that could knock over a, a, a car uh, farther and farther down the hill. But it starts out with that small thing. Many, many decisions start just that way, but they begin to roll and something else happens and you have the movement like a man simply pitching his tent towards Sodom. And, and again, he started in that direction and he would end up where he could never even imagine he would end up, surely. And uh, the writer makes the point in verse 12, he did that with his tents. But in verse 13, the very next verse, he explains the evil nature of the people that lived in Sodom. And we can just sense what will happen. We just sense something will take place there that will be troubling for this man, and surely they were. What were they? Well, the results of it were tragic. Eventually, these things happened to Lot. And I have the references here before me, but I won't give them to you. You can search uh, through uh, uh, the rest of the material uh, through chapter 19. Lot was captured and drug off. He had to be rescued by his uncle Abram later on. Uh, he had a life among wicked neighbors, and I mean wicked neighbors. His, ho his home and his city were eventually destroyed. He lost his wife. She was killed in a very interesting way. In a drunken state, he had an incestuous relationship with his two daughters, and they eventually produced two children from that incest. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, we have this New Testament passage about him. It talks about the Lord delivering him, delivering Lot, who was oppressed or vexed or tormented in his religious uh, or in his righteous soul day by day, seeing and hearing of the lawless deeds of those around about him. But notice, if he was wanting the best of life, if he, if he had wanted happiness, when he pitched his tent towards Sodom, he didn't get it. He was vexed in the spirit. He was tormented by what was happening all around him. And then you have that fascinating verse <clears throat> in, uh, uh, in, in uh, chapter 19, verse 16, when it says, as, as Lot and his family were escaping Sodom, when the Lord is bringing down fire and brimstone on, his, uh, on those cities, that he lingered. He lingered? In other words, he knew they were going to be destroyed, but he couldn't leave them as fast enough. He, he had to linger on the way out, even in the midst of their destruction. He didn't really want to leave that badly. What a tragedy in this man's life. Always there are consequences. Many times they're what we call unintended consequences. Do you think when he pitched his tent towards Sodom that he meant for all this to happen that we've just described? Of course not. But finally, I want to talk about our response, our response to Lot. Our concern is never to pitch our tent towards Sodom. I have found through 43 years of full-time ministry People leave the faith, not in one bold light switch turned on or off. In other words, waking up some morning saying, you know, I don't like this anymore. I don't believe this. I'm out of here. No. But what, it, what always happens, at least in my judgment, is that tiny step, that beginning, 
that tiny snowball, that pitching the tent in that direction. And then it takes another step and another step. And before long, we're not the same person. We're not in the same place spiritually. And I'm sure that many of you know exactly what I'm talking about and have seen this in the lives of those around about you. You get the whole package, in other words. We don't understand that. We don't realize that lots of times. But it's the whole package. You, you pitch your tent toward the, the, the Jordan Valley with all of its beauty and, and all of its productive elements. But you're also pitching your tent ultimately toward Sodom. We must not, or we must determine not to go in that direction. Self-interest should always be tempered by spiritual interest. As Jesus himself said in Matthew 16, 26, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? It won't be worth it, will it? And as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith. Lot, you should have walked by faith, just as Abraham did. And not by sight, not simply by what we can see. Thank you for sharing this with me this morning. I would say that we have a responsibility always with God to make sure that we're right and we're not taking that step in the wrong direction. There may be some of those that meet, someone this morning that needs to make a dramatic turn and a dramatic step toward God in faith and obedience to his will. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, do you need to confess your faith in the Lord this morning? Repenting of your sins, you can be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of all of your past sins. Become a part of the kingdom of God, enjoying the blessings and privileges of being a part of it. If you need the prayers of the Lord's Church, even for what we've talked about this morning, or you'd like to place your membership with us, won't you come now while together we stand and sing?